Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Ernstein, along with my co-host, my partner in crime, the doc himself, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. And uh, we have a very, very compelling subject for this show and, a, and an outstanding guest, a, a true pioneer for females in federal law enforcement. Her name is Patricia Naughton, Patty Naughton. She was one of the first DEA undercover females um, in the history of federal law enforcement and really set a trailblazed a path for women fighting the bad guys. And uh, she had a career that, you know, this woman uh, was a, a force of nature. Wherever she went, she had a, a career that spanned multiple states, multiple categories of, of organized crime. Some of her work took her to our home base of Detroit, Michigan, where back in the 1980s, she was actually able to infiltrate the infamous Jackaloni crew. And she's going to tell us that story as well as many more. Thank you for joining us, uh, Patricia Naughton. Well, thank you for those compliments. I'm I kind of a little overwhelmed, but thank you so much. And thank you for including me in this podcast. You are a true superstar that has a lot of historical significance, and we want to hear your story. So why don't we kind of start from, um, you know, let's, let's start at your roots. Uh, where did you grow up, and how, how did you get into uh, law enforcement? Well, I grew up in southern Indiana. I was born in San Francisco. My mom was in the Navy in World War II. Um, and I grew up in Bloomington, which is the home of Indiana University. My mom was a middle school librarian. She was hearing impaired her whole life, and she did a wonderful job, a bright woman. And my dad was in the labor unions as a business agent. He was a painter. And uh, I, I grew up there. I went to Indiana University. And I had an inkling, as odd as it is, that, that it would be wonderful to be an undercover officer or agent. And I don't know where that started, but I loved acting as well. And Indiana University had one of the very early criminal justice programs. So I jumped in and it was like, oh, my God. It was, it was karmic. It was meant to be. It was a great time because I actually graduated in 1974 and I was going through school with Viet, Vietnam veterans who would come back after the war and were also in criminal justice. And that meant a lot to me. And that also really started my affinity for men and women in the military. Uh, that, that really, really touched me. So when I graduated in 1974, I got a job with the Bloomington Police Department as a police dispatcher. Now, Bloomington, I think, is about 120,000, but 40 of that is students, and it's an agrarian society and a huge manufacturer or, or however, cultivator of limestone, the limestone quarries are very important. And if you remember the fabulous movie Breaking Away, that was all about the Bloomington limestone quarries in Indiana University. So I got a job as police dispatcher. And let me tell you, I have great mad respect for anyone on the 911 system. Because at the time, I was often alone and I was in charge of all the ambulance, police, fire calls, for not just the city, but the entire county. And you've never experienced life until you had a woman, a senior woman call in and say, oh my God, my husband's dying, send the ambulance and hang up. And this is before the, we had the ability to trace back. So I, I did that and then I decided I want to go back for a master's degree. I talked to the chief and said I'd send me to records so I can go back to college. He said, I want you to apply for a police officer. And at the time, there'd been two police officers that had come on, each female, that had left after a year. And I don't blame them. It wasn't easy. And then there were two that were on board as police officers that hadn't been through the academy, and they were in their 40s. Very nice women. So I got hired on. I went through the academy. And um, I must humbly say I'm very proud that I was the first female class president the Indiana State Law Enforcement Academy. I still don't know how I got elected. We made speeches. But it was a huge honor for me. And um, uh, although Colonel Freed, who was the, the head of the academy, I heard he was not pleased. 
But uh, I came back to Bloomington. I started working street patrol. The narcotics unit help, needed help at night uh, searching um, informants. So I started moonlighting with them. And then after I'd been doing that for about four months, I ended up dra- directing traffic during the day at the intersection in town and two houses down one street was a place where I was buying dope at night. I basically just kind of started doing the undercover stuff myself. So uh, I was put full-time into undercover narcotics. The state police didn't have women narcs. I don't think they had any troopers, female at the time, because right now we're talking 1974, 1975. So, uh, they sent somebody down. We got more funds and money, and I would travel throughout the state of Indiana going in to places where the male narcotics agents had been unable to infiltrate. What that meant was going into heroin dens and a, a lot of very difficult places, and I'm not going to bullshit anybody and tell you I wasn't scared. But uh And especially contrary to what you see sometimes is, we don't sleep with our drug defendants and we don't use drugs. So especially in a heroin den situation, that became very, very difficult. And I, the only thing I can say is I'm Scots Irish. I developed a tremendous line of bullshit. If I can just interrupt for a moment. So you, you had to convince them that you were a junkie that so, so that they would buy it. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Convince them as I was a junkie or I was buying for my old man who was a junkie. And get in there and get dope and get out without using. And especially with the heroin den thing, I can think of one thing. I, I think I was down in Evansville. I, I, I think this guy was in a condo high rise. And I remember when I went in, they, that they told me he likes for the women to bump him up, which is inject them with heroin. That's very sexy, I guess, to them to have a woman inject them. When I went in, he had this metal door and a bar that goes all the way across. You know, and I was worried. And uh, so I just said, hey, I got to get this my old my man. I'll come back. And then it was like, bye. See ya. But it was it was not easy. It was uh, these were crazy times. And unlike with CEA, when you're working at the local level, you're you're dealing with a lot of low life, a lot of dirt bags, you know, a lot of users. So, yeah, it was not easy. Patty, let me interject one thing here. A small digression. This is reminding me a little bit of one of the most underrated movies of the 1990s, a movie that was called Rush with Jason Patrick and yeah. Jennifer Jason Lee, where they were they played a couple that were infiltrating drug circles yeah. down in Texas. And the Jennifer Jason Lee character was this very innocent looking female that had to be as as fierce and, you know, as tough as leather. I mean, just yeah. uh, tough as nails. Did you have seen that movie? And was there any kind of parallels to the, the life you were leading? Not only did I see it somewhere in all of my storage things, I have the original poster that I convinced the mu- movie theater to give me. Oh, yeah, that's cool. So that movie was close to your heart. Is Ray Liotta in that movie too? Sam uh, Sam Elliott played okay. the played okay. the police captain. And there's some okay. And then uh, talking about our love of rock and roll, Greg Allman played the drug kingpin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I watched that. I, I I can probably recite some of the lines. And I I always wanted to come out to California and write, which of course I'm trying to do now. And that was one of the inspirations because I thought, damn, I can I have a story, you know. Uh, but it, it was it was very inspirational, and I think it was really indicative of the times that we were coming into. Uh, you know, with the whole drug culture and everything. And yeah, I thought that was a tremendous movie. That movie took place in 1975 and she was living the same exact yeah. life, just in a different part of the country, almost identical to the Jennifer Jason Lee character. Really the most memorable in terms of uh, pop culture, the thing that people most remember from that film is the Eric Clapton song, Tears from Heaven, which I believe won an Oscar and a Grammy. It was written about his son that had died, tragically fell off a, of a balcony. And that's what people remember about that film. But the film itself is really a, a great piece of cinema and a, a look into uh, the work of undercover narco detectives. So let's, let's get back on track, Patty, and, and tell us how you, how you segued from working in, in local law enforcement in Indiana to federal law enforcement? Well, I worked with a, a DEA on a couple of cases while I was with a PD. And then I must tell you, 
that in 1978 after, or no, 1976, after a divorce, I was married to an IU campus police officer. I got the opportunity to go with the IU police department up in Indianapolis, Indiana University, IUPUI, uh, where I became detective lieutenant over the investigative bureau. I was there two years, and I must also give credit to Colonel Spurgeon Davenport, who is a retired Indianapolis uh, deputy chief, one of the very, very first early black officers, and he was really an instrumental influence and mentor on me. And then I was recruited and picked up by DEA in 1978, the spring of 78, and um, I was specifically hired at that time for undercover. Um, that was that's what they were really looking for. And so I started in the academy in um, June June 12th of 1978. How many women were in, your, were in your class? I think there was six, and we lost one, and it was historic. It was really historic, and they you could really tell, again, the influence of the Vietnam era was huge. And they, they had about a 20% washout. They, I think the class started at maybe 25. They washed out one guy who would have been a wonderful agent. He was one of the guys that broke the John Gacy thing back in, was outside of Chicago. They let him go the day before graduation, Raphael Tovar, which I never understood. He was a fine, fine man. Um, but anyway, the, the influence of the Vietnam War was very, very big on the academy. You had a lot of the trainers that had come out of Vietnam. And the training was beyond rigorous. In three months, I dropped four clothing sizes. Um, injuries were rampant. Yeah, it was, it was in, insane. Um, but it was a wonderful program. And just to give you an example of the mentality at the time, I, his name, I'm spacing on his last name, but he had been a national golden gloves champ and we were having boxing. Okay. And, um, I remember I was paired with an agent by the name of, of Finnis Ray Price, who's long retired. And I heard him pull a price aside and say, I want you to knock her out. And if you don't knock her out, I'm going to knock you out. <laughs> and it's pretty intense. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I used this line that I had used when I was in uniform, when I was trying to arrest a man that was a lot bigger than I was. I, I would say, my mother always told me my face is my best asset. And so if I think you're going to hurt me, I'm going to have to shoot you. <laughs> and then with Ray, I said, you know, I said, you know, my face is my, I said the same thing. I said, Ray, my face is my best asset. asset. My mother's always said, don't ever do anything. Don't ever let your face get hurt. So if I think you're really going to hurt me, I'm going to have to kick you so hard in the ball if you're going to be screaming for a week. <laughs> That's smart. It might sum up uh, Patty Naughton in, in one little anecdote. Going forward, this this was not someone that you wanted to mess with. Uh, she she was a uh, a true uh, a true force of nature. Well, thank you. Well, you know, you have to wing it. And and the thing is, I really didn't have anybody before me, so I was making it up. As I went, and, and I'll never forget, he had big brown eyes, and his eyes just looked like saucers. And so we slugged the shit out of each other, but we made <clears throat> disproportionate screaming noises to the point where they must have believed that we were beating the crap out of each other. So we survived. Um, Patty, when you were going through all this, and you are going through the academy in 1978, and like you said, there was six women in the class, and that had that number of women had, had never been at that level with, with that, that amount of inclusion. Did you realize that you were blazing a trail, that this was pioneering on your behalf? You know, Scott, I wish I could say I had those noble feelings, but if you'll excuse my, excuse my French, I just said, God, please get me the fuck through this. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, little bit more uh, micro I'm, than macro. <laughs> a little more granny. Yeah, I was like, you know, and, and the, the physical injuries, uh, one guy ended up with a broken collarbone. I had infantitis in my legs. 
I mean, it was beyond intense. And I must tell you that the other thing they did with the women is they brought us in and tried to make us cry. I kid you not. And um, they individually, they would, they had this group, the counselors and these people, and they would try to make us cry. And uh, I was so proud. There was only one other woman and myself, and we didn't cry. You know, this kind of badgering thing. And I, I, I must say, uh, uh, you know, this was new. And and I will tell you this because I did I didn't understand this much later when I really started to reflect. I know women who went through law enforcement. I went through a lot. I went through an unbelievable amount of crap. And I have never been angry about it because we were changing the way men perceived women. I mean, not just us, all sorts of women, doctors, you know, uh, women that work driving big equipment, fire women, and you know, the whole thing. But anybody that looks at history and things that has that historically we're just going to have a kumbaya moment and it's going to be, Oh, sure. You can be a federal agent. I don't, I agree that you don't have to have testosterone and my masculine's not masculinity is not insulted. They're crazy. It's a struggle. So I, I'm really cool with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really cool. And I, I am glad that I was able to contribute. I went on, I was the first woman there's a, a plaque somewhere, in, in, well, now they've moved, but it was at Quantico. I was the first woman to shoot a perfect score at the range. And uh, it was on the last day of qualification, and we were taking a bus to Quantico because at the time the academy was in actually the DEA headquarters, and then we used off-site for different things. And it was so funny. I did because I went on to be the first woman weapons instructor teaching at FBI at Quantico as a guest instructor and then my own division. Um, but, but the instructor was so excited that I, 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 we were close. I knew it was close when I got the perfect score. It was a scorching day. He dumped a whole huge cooler of orange Gatorade on me. <laughs> and there's a lot of bees. Won the Super there. Bowl. <laughs> yeah, and and so, yeah, yes, yeah, you know, I never thought of that, but yeah, the the masculine thing. He was so excited, and he wanted to do it's a triumphant something moment. that was, I guess, honoring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here I'm running around like a one woman bee catcher, and then we had to ride all the way back into DC on the bus. She's sticky oh. from the but, um, from the carbonation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, but I was happy, and then I, I I they really wanted me to go to Miami. Oh my God, I did tour of duties down there. I drove the go fast, chasing drug smugglers coming in in the middle of the night. One of the greatest experiences of my life. Oh my God, but I was the daughter of really elderly parents. My dad was just shy of fifty, and mom just months shy of forty two when I was born. First and only child, only first marriage for them. And I really didn't think I could do it. So uh, I, I ranked really high in the class. And when they asked me where I wanted to go, I said, I want to go to Detroit. <laughs> and uh, and they, once you pull them off I the was, floor from them, <laughs> from them fainting that you were yeah. requesting a transfer to Detroit. Right. <laughs> Most people once, they regain, yeah. once they regain consciousness, what did you tell them? Yeah. Reasoning for wanting yeah. to come to Detroit. <laughs> Yeah, I think what happened is somebody went outside and told the uh, paddy wagon with the men in white suits that they, they could go ahead and go. They'd handle it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and I was one. I said, don't don't ever tell anybody you want to go to Detroit because I'd, I'd let some people know ahead of time that we're already on the job back in Indy that this is probably what I was going to do. And they're like, They'll think you're nuts. They'll think, <laughs> excuse me, that's not what he said. They'll think you're fucking nuts. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's like volunteering so, for frontline um, duty in Vietnam. <laughs> well, let me be a grunt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but uh, but I got to tell you, so I, I came to Detroit and and I was thinking about it because I knew I was going to talk to you today. You know, I mean, Detroit was hopping. You know, Detroit was absolutely hopping at the time. It was homicide, murder capital of the nation, which, of course, you know, two million people at the time. 
the Motown sound, which to this day is still my jam. I love the Motown sound. Two of the members of the Four Tops lived in my condo complex. I mean, it was tremendous. I remember the music was everywhere. I remember sitting at a Stephanie Mills concert, a supper club, you know, little tiny Stephanie Mills. I don't know if you guys remember. Yep. From the late uh, 70s. Big, big sound. But yeah, but tiny, tiny woman. And all of a sudden, up comes in her bright yellow long gown with a cigarette and a drink in one hand, Aretha Franklin. And just comes up and kind of almost gives Stephanie a hip bump, you know, and she just took over the stage. And that was the kind of energy that was there. Um, and, and so it, it was okay. You know, I, I was cool with it. The, the first day I reported for the you really immersed yourself in, in your new home. I mean, not just taking a new job, but wanting to be able to feel and smell and taste all the texture of, of the city that you were coming into. Scott, I was a woman born in 1951 in Bloomington, Indiana. I, I love Bloomington. I still have friends back there. But I never could have had these opportunities. I mean, my God, and I never would have been pushed. I mean, going through the academy alone was a huge push, both physically and mentally. I, I went to places mentally and physically I never knew I had. And and it was incredible. I, I must share with you, I, I know you have other questions, but I knew that I wanted to tell you this. On the first day I reported for duty, I had like a suit on, a nice pretty skirt and, and, you know, jacket and high heels. This is last time I wore those. But anyway, I parked on Fort Street, one block down from the back side of the federal building. And I was walking to the corner. First day, okay, arrived in Detroit. Here I am. And there's this huge, like, um, light pillar, I think. And it's about 12 inches in diameter, you know, going all the way up. And it's solid rock and all this stuff. And as I get close to the corner there, this, sadly, this really deranged man, you know, just really out of his mind. He is beating the shit out of this pillar. And he is cussing at it. And he's having a conversation with it. And he's smacking it. And I said to myself, yeah, this is what Detroit's going to be like. <laughs> welcome to the Motor City. Yeah, welcome. We're crazy as currency. Let, let me ask you, Patty. So, yeah. when, so when you so you get this assignment, what was the first like um, uh, when when they're trying to um, explain the underworld landscape in Detroit? Italian mafia guys, African American gangsters. What what was that like? What were some of the the names that they threw out to you? What 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 was that like, the underworld landscape, as they explained it to you in Detroit? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't getting a lot of explanation. <laughs> <laughs> you had to find out in, mean, the, in the field. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was there were two other women, and they both left. So I was the only woman in three states. Um, uh, so at first, they weren't even talking a lot, but, but I had a great first assignment. I'll share that with you, but... Interestingly enough, a guy by the name of Harry Hansel, who became a great partner, had uh, they just closed the Columbus, Ohio office. It was a RAC office, which means resident agent, a small one. And um, I wasn't assigned with him at first, but later on, this, this kind of fit the mold. He came up, and our desks were seated next to each other, and he looked at me and he said, I can't work with you. You have to go to another office. <laughs> And that was kind of how he, you know, a lot of them really felt that way. And I said, well, I got bad news for you. I got no place to go, so it's on you. <laughs> and we became great partners. But my my first partner, we really didn't have much of a relationship. But my second partner was, he was out of Vietnam. He had come back from Vietnam. And um, he was a guy that looked for all the world like Bobby Knight. I mean, they looked alike. They presented. The comportment was the same. The general vocabulary. And, I hope yeah. vocabulary was the same. quite <laughs> vociferous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he wasn't so much of a cusser, 
but he was a reserve, a reserve captain in the army reserve, and he would wear combat boots to work. But he's really the guy that, that amazingly enough, kind of had my back. Um, at the first assignment we did, rather than really talking about stuff, my first assignment, I was assigned to one of four clandestine labs in the entire country. The entire country. And labs were really big. You know, you think about it, I mean, people were cooking everything, you know? Um, and so I was, I was assigned to that and it was a fabulous time because you would jump in the car and you could end up somewhere 400 miles somewhere else. You know, uh, I mean, labs were just everywhere. And, um, you know, you lived in your car, you had all your stuff, you were gone for days. Labs are, are tremendously dangerous, as we know. And, Scott, I think, as you know, I did just finally finish a, a, a movie script. I just finally finished it. I got off my butt about the back in the day, about the clandestine labs. And so that was really cool. But at the same time, they, I started getting shipped around to go undercover on heroin and on different things. And at the same time, within a couple years in, the biker influence was huge in terms of drugs in Detroit. And um, the, the, the transporting of, of drugs both into Canada and down from Canada was was a really big thing. One of my undercover things was a buy bust of 40,000 hits of uh, keep on trucking acid. And it's really weird because who knew, you know, uh, the, I, I just kind of, and, you know, enjoyed working on them. And yeah, that was the 40,000 uh, hits that uh, we seized on an undercover thing on a, a buy bust thing. Uh, involving, I brought my partner, the, I brought Roger in as, um, as my boyfriend, interestingly enough, just when you think you know what the times are like, he never wanted to be the main guy when it was my case. He always wanted it to be my case. And after all these years, I I think of him very fondly. He uh, he he was very troubled by a lot of things going on with the government. And, of course, he'd just come back from Vietnam. Um so he had a lot of issues going on, and he ended up leaving DEA. But um, I have great affinity, and he still lives in, I think, Canton Township or Canton or something. But he, he really, he really, you know, he really helped me a lot when nobody else wanted to work with me. But, yeah, the, the biker influence, and, of course, as we all know, I don't know how much you've talked about it on the podcast, but motorcycle gangs are a tremendous form of under organized crime as well. Yep, there's a lot of cross pollination with uh, with the with the Italians, and, and especially here in Detroit, um, the outlaws and the highwaymen have always worked very closely with the uh, Tokos really crime family. That is really really interesting. That that is something I did not know, but it makes sense because when I was still, you know, in the '80s, you were seeing how they were were going into legitimate businesses as a front for their organization and for money laundering and different things. But I, uh, I worked undercover on them. And then I, I guess you're wondering about how I, I, I did a lot of traveling, you know, I did a lot of traveling going in places. Um, I did the uh, Outlaws and the Grim Reapers down in, uh, started in Kentucky and went down into the Southeast and um, spent a lot of time in a biker bar owned by, he was the past national president of the Grim Reapers. It was really interesting because that was in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, my nearest surveillance was across Six, a six lane highway. I mean, and you can't, you can't go in these places. It was, you know, pretty much similar to a, a, a clubhouse. You know, you couldn't have surveillance in there. They had uh, police on the take. And so I had to go in with no gun, no badge and no wire. And um, so that made for some pretty interesting um, ex experience. You just had to wing, you just had to wing um, it and just, it was like on a wing on a prayer that, that you were going to be able to kind of bootstrap your way 
in and out of that situation without any the support resources that you might get in other situations? I think that's that's a very, very good point. And I think for me, if I, if I didn't, one, if I didn't absolutely plan and absolutely rehearse and absolutely, I mean, by like literally like writing a script, rehearse what I was going to say and what they might say and then what I would say in response and then what if all this stuff. I, I really, really had a plan going in. And then you also really do believe in God. I, I saw enough between being a cop and, and, and being in DEA that I know there's whatever you want to call it, there's got to be a higher power for damn sure. So for you to infiltrate the, the biker groups, did they think you were like one of the, the so-called old ladies or did they think you were a buyer or how did you like earn their trust and, and integrate that or um, infiltrate that operation? Yeah, no, see that, that, and you hit on something that's really the key and that I really learned very early on working undercover for DEA is you're nobody's old lady. Anytime you, especially with the biker thing, you know, you're, 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 you're not anybody's old. If, if you go in from that, you're going to have trouble. I went in from a money standpoint and I said I was from Virginia. And, uh, that's how you went in. And I had an informant, uh, take me in and I, I'm, I'm sorry. And now I'm just talking too much, but I must tell you, this is a really funny anecdote because this is a sign of the times. Um, when I was going in on the Grim Reapers and the chapter president of the outlaws in Louisville, and I met this informant for the first time and we're all up in this hotel, you know, meeting the whole crew, getting ready for all this. And I'm meeting this informant and I've got this tight black uh, t-shirt, tank top with the name of some motorcycle shop or something on it. And I got my big uh, uh, Harley belt on and Harley earrings and stuff. And and I'm meeting this guy and we start having an argument because he says I can't wear my bra <laughs> to the meeting. But they'll know I'm not a biker chick. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I didn't know. I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't think of that. <laughs> and at the time, I think I was thirty six, you know. And the body starts giving a little bit, <laughs> and I didn't want my, I didn't want my sagging boobs going in for me. But that's but that's like the kind of detail that the authenticity, right? That 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 would give you away. So yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it was the stupidest damn thing, but it still resonates with me because. You know, it's just one of these funny little things that happen. Um, but I, I did go in there, you know, and did very well. And then we brought in another a undercover agent and we went down into the southeast. And uh, then he basically took over, had to take over the investigation because once we went down uh, into the clubhouse down and we flew down into Florida, because I had probably one of the biggest, um, the thing more than honestly anything in life, uh, the worst thing that ever could have happened to me. My beloved best friend, Lenny Gilman, died. And um, I don't know if you guys remember him. Lenny Gilman was the U.S. He's attorney. A He's a, he was a prosecutor. And, uh, Leonard Gilman. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he was the best friend I've ever had in my entire life. And I got the call. I was down there going undercover and uh, they called me because it was on the national news. And I had just talked to him the day before. Actually, I talked to him and then two hours later, he went into a coma and died. And that, that uh, I don't think Lenny has ever gotten the credit do him for the wonderful work he did and more than anything the wonderful human being Lenny Gilman was. Lenny taught me about compassion. He taught me humility. He taught me honor. He was such a fine man. So I came back up for that and then the next thing I know we've got the biker thing going and I get a call from a guy who's got a coke problem and I mean he is into the mob for thousands of dollars. And so that started my journey on the mafia. So where was kind of your entry point with the Detroit Italian group? Uh, I know you eventually made your way into 
Billy Jackaloni's crew, uh, just to give some context. Uh, the Jackaloni brothers were the street bosses of the Detroit mob. They ran day-to-day affairs for the Toko Zerilli crime family from the 50s into the 2000s. They were really the, the faces of the franchise. Tony Jack was uh, the older brother. Billy Jack was the younger brother. But they were both um, very uh, uh, e- equally uh, formidable. And uh, they, all, they both kind of ran their own crews. And Patty's going to tell us about kind of getting in deep with a lot of Billy Jack's guys. Well, it was really interesting because the guy that this informant was into is a guy by the name of Tom Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T. And Tom Knight owned, I'm thinking, what, is it a clock restaurant, Scott? Is that what I yeah, said? Yeah, there was a, clock? The, the clock restaurant um, for, for people that, are let's say, are under the age of... 50 um they probably don't remember i don't i don't remember the clock restaurant but i do know that there was a chain a very popular chain of 24 hour i don't think it was a diner it was more of like a what like the ram's horn is now or uh you know kind of like a half restaurant half coney island type uh spot and uh they were all around metro detroit uh the individual clock restaurants so yes the tom knight was one of the uh majority owners of, of that franchise yeah, I just wasn't sure if that was the name, but that, that does ring true now. Let me just add one more thing. Based on Knight's ownership of the chain, I believe a number of made members of the mafia in Detroit had ownership interests in some of the clock restaurants. I never even heard of that. See, that makes sense because what I was told was that anytime somebody gets out on parole, they're all working at the clock restaurant because, you know, they have to show that they have a job. And and that was, you know, that's what it was. So I met Tom Knight and, uh, and did a a Coke deal with, I don't remember if it was one or two and out with him. Uh, And at the same time, I met a guy named uh, Merrill Steers. And I don't know if he would have been up on any of your radar, but he was he was kind of, I think, kind of a, a hang along. His father, apparently they owned the family owned a big uh uh spirits warehouse, which would make sense again, you know, with the mob and everything. It was a big beer, wine and alcohol warehouse. And uh that's how I, I met uh, Merrill Sears. Um and interestingly enough, Merrill asked to meet with me when his with his attorney when he was under you know arrest and they were going through. I think he was pleading and he asked to meet with me. And I'll never forget this because he was a sweet guy. I mean, he was a sweet guy. I, you know, you never got any wasn't a knucklehead at all. He said in front of his lawyer, "When I get out of jail, will you marry me?" <laughs> And I'll never forget that. Okay. You know? I'll never forget that. And, and I do want to share that, you know, as kind of an anecdote as to what happens if, you, if you're working undercover a lot. You really do meet all types. And, and not everybody is an asshole, to be honest with you, you know. But anyway, so, so then I met Fred Kalel through Tom Knight. And do you guys know about Fred Kalel? Yeah, so Fred Kalel was a... I believe he was Lebanese or Syrian, uh, was a big time drug dealer uh, in Metro Detroit, was hooked up with the Jackalones. And then around Kalel were a number of other Middle Eastern and Jewish drug figures that were also gambling figures in the Jackalones orbit. But the Jackalones were always very smart uh, the way they handled the, the drug dealing and the fact that they were always, this was kind of a... A hallmark of, of Detroit mob crews, uh, always very insulated, or there would be three, four people removed from those deals. But, Remember, uh, Willie Chi Chi? Yes, yeah. yeah, Senator, there's a lot of buffers. Yeah, a lot of buffers. <laughs> Buttons, buffers. And the Godfather. Yeah. Right. Press a button on a guy. Right. So, yes, Kalel was in that orbit, and a lot of those guys were using a very prominent Jewish mob figure by the name of Alan Hilf, who they called the general. Um, they were yeah. using Hilf yeah. as the go between. Uh, for themselves and the Jackalones. Yeah, absolutely. And and Fred said was such an interesting little guy. Um, Scott knows I've started writing a nonfiction book 
call I, the working title is the nature of an undercover because I'm, I'm not trying to get off subject, but the opening part is about me doing surveillance on Fred to get a kind of an idea of what he's about before going undercover with them. Cause I used to do that it would drive my supervisor crazy, but I wanted to, you could get a read on people or a beat as we used to say in the business, you get a beat on somebody and understand what they're like. And he was a short little guy, very dapper and just walked with all the confidence in the world, you know? Uh, but I, so I got involved with him and, and uh, buying off of him and from him, I got into the silent woman, which of course on eight mile road, which we later seized my partner. I had transferred out here. My partner actually seized the silent woman, did the case on it. It was a big hot spot for, for drug dealers. It was like yeah. a strip club uh, that a lot of drug deals would go down at. The mob was heavily involved there. And Frank it was, Vanessa m- d- mentioned yeah, that. Yeah. It, it was one of those early eight yeah. mile strip clubs. Now, if you come to Detroit now and you go on eight mile, there's a strip club literally like every five feet. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's, I love it's it. strip club, I can't wait strip to club central for, for the Midwest. <laughs> um, and I'm talking about, you know, 10, 15 miles of just strip club after strip club after strip club. But back in the eighties, late seventies, early eighties, there was just a, a uh, handful of them that that marked uh, Eight Mile, and, and the Silent Woman was one of the most uh, popular. And I know that Billy Jackaloni, if we're if we're talking about the Jackaloni crew, Billy Jackaloni was someone that was extorting the Silent Woman, and was either him or his enforcers, collectors were going there on a the pretty bomb. regular. And the bomb and Bobby Lapuma <laughs> and Ronnie oh, Morelli, yeah. they were all going in there to collect. You know how I described it. It was like the bar scene in the movie Star Wars with Jabba the Hutt and all the weird, <laughs> ah, weird great. things, you know? Yeah. That's I great. I mean, and, uh, I mean, and, and, and I'm going to jump off and tell you because I, because uh, I want to tell you how I met Al Haiti because he was interested in, instrumental in introducing me to people. But I, I got to tell you about the silent woman now. I think uh, if that's okay to kind of, kind of stay on it. Yep, so Fred Kalel. Bobby LaPuma, um, Alan Hills, uh, Pete Cavateo, um, I'm trying to think close. They were all regulars there. So I had created a persona thanks to meeting Al Haiti. He kind of planted the thing in my mind. I had to come up. Well, I'll tell you that I met him. What was it? The Golden Mushroom? Was that the name of it? I think yeah. in Southfield. So the Golden Mushroom is okay. on like 12 in Southfield, uh, I believe. And um, yeah. Al Haiti, for, for, for anyone that doesn't recognize the name, Al Haiti was a bartender and driver for Billy Jackaloni. Uh, very, very close to, uh, to Billy and uh, was, was someone that would often run interference for him. Yeah, he, he was, and when I, when I was with him and that's how I met the, the son, it was almost, I got the impression that he was teaching, like teaching the kid the ropes, almost kind of. I could be wrong. And then at that time in the 80s, right at the corner of 12 and Southfield, you had the Golden Mushroom, which was a, a, a fancy restaurant that these guys like to post up at, would be the, the, the northeast corner. And then if you went to the, Southeast corner, there was Dimitri's, which was another hangout. Yes. So they would just kind of go yes. back and forth uh, across Southfield Road uh, and either be at, at Dimitri's or or the Golden Mushroom. That was a big hangout for Billy Jackaloni's guys. Bobby LaPuma, Al Haiti, um, Jackie Jackaloni, who's Billy's son, who's now the reputed boss, um, all used to be cool. on the weekends. They used to be uh, at, at uh, the Golden Mushroom and Dimitri's. See, this is so cool because for me, I have snippets of relationships and you know, the whole, the history. So that's, it's frankly, for me, it's really cool. You know, you know, you, you and I've talked quite a bit, Scott, to, to get the background on it because, you know, I was just in there trying to do my thing and not get hurt, you know, but Al Haiti um, Haiti took a liking to you though, right? He did. And it was the weirdest thing, but see, this is, this is, This is the thing about the mob and about organized crime and Hollywood. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, the business thing is it's do you know this person, okay? If somebody knows you and knows you and spouches for you, 
then I'm not going to say you're golden right away, but you're on the path. So I started going into the golden mushroom after I'd done a deal with Tom, Tom Knight, and hanging at the bar and talking to the female bartenders and just shooting the shit and stuff. And uh, so one day I went in there and Al Haiti was there and, and I didn't know who he was at the time. I knew who Al Haiti was. But I didn't know that that was he. So anyway, I start talking to her. And the next thing, she obviously gave him the heads up, you know. And um, he came and started talking to me. And I looked down at his hand. And he had a diamond ring on his right pinky. I think it was pinky. And it was all, it was A-H and big ass diamonds. I mean, like, you know, at least quarter of a carat each diamond. And, uh, you know, he was trying to impress me and I said, so what do you do? You know, so I'm not going to say I'm a drug dealer because that's what a cop would say, you know, it's stupid. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's not how it works. So I said, well, I do property management. I have my own properties. I'm going through a divorce and, you know, and all this stuff. So he sends me to the phone. He says, I want you to talk to my friend. So he has me call. Uh, what's the brother? Is it Billy Jackalone? Who he said really? I was told really wasn't in the business. No, that would have been. It, it probably would have been Jack Jackalone, the other Jack Jackalone, who was Tony's mm. son, who really wasn't that oh, involved. Okay. So he asked me talking to this guy on the phone, and I mean, I'm just winging it, you know, and. And he's giving me all this advice and everything, and I thought it was really nice. And then Al Heidi, you know, wanted to get together and all this stuff. So I started a friendship with Al Haiti. And and this was the really, really difficult part because, and I get so pissed that you don't screw your defendants. It's called entrapment. You know, um, and so it was a very, very delicate relationship. And later on, he even asked me to go down to let's see, is it the Gold Coast down in Miami? Is that what they call yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. He asked me to go down there with him. They were having a big thing. I think that's where old man Jack Maloney was staying. He was staying out of state. Yeah, they both, uh, both Tony and Billy had uh, residences in, on the Gold Coast and would be there like half the year. Yeah. So, and, and of course we wanted me to go, uh, but you know, what can you do? I mean, this isn't going anywhere good. And I fended him off as much as humanly possible. So I couldn't go down with him. I must say before I, I, I must say one thing is, is Al Haiti was a gentleman. You know what I mean? I mean, he was not a knucklehead any time that I was around him. He, I, I never got that feeling from him at all. And I remember at one point it came out, you know, about me being a drug dealer. And I'll never forget, he said to me, he said, you know, if this was anywhere but Detroit, you wouldn't be allowed to do anything without us giving you the okay. But the inference was at the time that they weren't really doing a lot in drugs. I mean, I, I don't know if that's that's true or not, but I know he was really. They were giving uh, that a lot of lip service, but I think yeah. on the back end of a lot of that lip service was, well, we'll still take an envelope and we might know that yeah. that envelope is coming from drug dealing, but just don't tell us that envelope is coming from drug dealing so we can kind of play this, this role of... Uh, uh, blissful ignorance or intentional ignorance. Um, but there's no doubt that the, the Jackalones were doing a lot of drugs. Remember, they would say, oh, I, I see loan sharking has been very, yeah. <laughs> very prosperous this, <laughs> this, this let, let me Let me also, <laughs> I, I want to uh, backtrack for, for one quick second. Um, uh, the Golden Mushroom and Dimitri's were, were on 10 in Southfield, not 12 in Southfield. So I don't know why I was saying 12. Okay. But yeah, it was 10 Mile yeah. in Southfield Road. Golden Mushroom okay. was on the uh, northeast corner, and the uh, mm -hmm. Dimitri's was, was on the southwest corner. Sorry, I just wanted to correct that, because I know that there was going to be people that lived in Detroit yeah. and remember the Golden Mushroom, and they're going to say, that wasn't on 12 yeah, Mile. You don't know what you're talking about. And that was on 10 Mile. <laughs> Sorry. But the Golden Mushroom, yeah. by the time I was in college, the Golden Mushroom was gone. But I remember as a kid uh, going to the Golden Mushroom for, um, like, uh, you know, special special occasions. So 
talk about building that case that eventually takes down uh, Bobby LaPuma and some other Jackaloni affiliated organized crime figures, but never actually touched the Jackalonis. Well, I have to be honest with you. I I was not that that in that big of a way bringing them down. Um, I spent a lot of time undercover on them. I was there when Pete Cavateo was executed. Yeah, Pete Cavateo wow. was um, murdered um, in wow. July of 1985. Yeah. Was the last made yeah. member of the mafia in Detroit to be killed gangland style. Uh, they called him Fast Pete or yeah. Pete the Baker. Um, was known as a um, they called him Fast Pete because he lived fast. Someone that was known to uh, sleep with a lot of guys' wives that he shouldn't be and, and ripping guys off in drug deals. Um, he was being protected by his brother-in-law, Dominic uh, Detroit Fats Corrado. Uh, and then it wasn't a coincidence that uh, Fats Corrado died the last week of June 1985. And uh, within 10 days, I believe, Pete Cavatayo was killed uh, once Fats Corrado was out of the picture, um, the, the sharks began circling and, uh, and ended up killing Cavatayo. But, uh, yeah, so th- that would have been 80, uh, summer of 85. And, and what, I, what I got from them, because I'll never forget, because, you know, we would all sit together at the silent woman, and he had this girlfriend, and I can't, I can't I think her name was Carol. Uh, it was kind of a new girlfriend. Um, but, but we were all together, but I'll never forget right after he was, killed or shortly thereafter you know so of course i went into the silent woman with the gang and um and uh she was there and she was boohooing and she went to go to the bathroom and i started to get up and bobby lapuma said leave her alone she's probably the one that killed him which of course is bullshit wow well, we, but, we, i'll um, tell you what, what we do well, know at least based on fbi informants yeah. even though no one's ever been charged with the Cavatayo hit, it did re- that the the indictment did reach a grand jury stage back um, in the '90s, but the star witness ended up recanting his testimony. They almost charged that case, but uh, FBI informants have wow. been really uh, adamant uh, over the last 35 years that the Billy Jackaloni crew was in charge of of uh, organizing and carrying out the the Pete Cavatayo murder. What they had told me, and I think, uh, you know, we talked about it, is he had been doing layoff betting and he didn't have approval. He was doing a lot of stuff he shouldn't have been doing, you know, dating back 20 years before he was killed. Uh, there was FBI documents back in the 60s uh, recalling that members of of uh, the family going to the higher ups and asking permission to kill Cavatayo in the 60s and 70s. But the answer was always you couldn't do it because he was protected by his best friend, Dominic. Carrado, who he was married to uh, Dominic Carrado's sister. Sparky Carrado? No, uh, oh, Fats, Fats, Fats Carrado. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Fats. Right. yeah. So he was married to Fats' sister. He was married Sparky to Sparky was the generation above right. Cavatayo. So Fats' Carrado's sister was married to Pete Cavatayo. So he was brother, Cavatayo was brother-in-laws with uh, Detroit Fats Carrado and Tony the Bull Carrado. Fats Carrado loved Pete Cavatayo, was like best friends with the guy and, and wanted to protect him. Yeah. Tony the Bull, on the other hand, had no love for um, for 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 P. Cavatayo. and I heard that the order to kill Cavatayo actually came at the wake for Dominic Crado. Tony the Bull comes in to his own brother's wake and and calls a couple people to a meeting in the back of a funeral home and says, "All right, now we're getting rid of my brother-in-law." Wow! Wow! You know, I gotta say, as an aside, as an aside, excuse me for saying so, but him with the ladies. It, <laughs> I never saw the appeal, but anyway. That? Right. <laughs> maybe maybe that was more of like in the 60s when in his younger days. But I definitely know he had a reputation of sleeping with guys' wives when they went to prison. He was a pretty frumpy guy. I, I want to share, share a story with you that I think you'll get a kick out of because I know we don't have much time right now. But I also have a great resource for... Uh, I'd like like to hook you up with that. I think could give you a great interview about the, that takedown. Yeah. And he's my old partner and my junior partner who <laughs> junior in name only because he was a Detroit cop first. And I want to hook you up with him. He and I are still in touch. And he's the one that did the paper because I know that we had um, some dirty cops that were arrested as part of it. Um, 
uh, the silent woman, there was city kickbacks. I think it was Southfield, but I have to look into it, but this is a great, this is just a great, I, I just, I need to share this with you. Um, so Candy Davidson, we know who he was. So Candy Davidson was, a, another Jack Ohlone associate, uh, was a purple gang Jewish mobster, yep. uh, from the twenties and thirties that by the seventies and eighties was a geriatric, but was still dabbling in drug affairs and mob affairs actually took a drug case, I believe in 88 but was one of the last last remnants of the Purple Gang to be operating in the Detroit uh, organized crime uh, orbit. He actually also had a case in 1978. Mm -hmm. I was a brand new agent, and uh, so they arrested him on, he, had, he had, was paying some guy to manufacture, I think it was PCP, and they busted him. And they called me in because kiss of death, when I was a detective, they sent me to FBI fingerprint school. So that was everybody's excuse for me to come and do the fingerprints because they'd be done right. They just didn't want to do them. But it's okay. I get it. And so I was brought in as a young agent, 27 years old, to fingerprint Candy Davidson. And I'll never forget it. He had a pale blue leisure suit on, dressed to the nines, you know. And the agent was like trying to pump him. He went to snitch. And this agent was not full of finesse. He was a good agent, but, you know, not talking to mobsters. He was not, he was more of a book, book agent rather than a street agent. And he kept bugging Candy. And finally, Candy just looked at him. He said, you know who I am, right? You know where I've been. You know who I'm with. So you know I ain't going to say anything. So let's just get on with it and take me to jail. Okay. <laughs> So fast forward, I think it was 1987, I think. Candy Davidson is getting out of prison. And Bobby LaPuma is picking him up, okay? And they're having this huge party for him at an Italian restaurant. It wasn't in Detroit. It was in the western suburbs. I'll, I'll, I'll come up with it. Again, you can't have any surveillance, okay? There's absolutely, you can't, in these places, you never have any surveillance. Um, and Al Haiti invited me to go. And some of the other guys had girlfriends, but once the lunch started, everybody left but me. You know, he wanted me to stay. And I was nervous because I put the cuffs on this guy yeah. and took him down to 1300 Bobby. And You're thinking he could recognize you. Yeah, I was scared to death. And I got, I got nobody. I mean, I'm, I'm on my own, you know, and I remember the restaurant was, it was a mob, a mob restaurant, you know, it was very closed in, you know, I mean, and nobody was there and they had the whole restaurant for this. And so Candy Davidson, they bring him in and there's this whole table full of mobsters and stuff. And he walks by me and he looks at me and he goes and he gets seated on the other side of that lady. <laughs> He's looking at me. And I was like, man, this is it, you know, goodbye to my parents, you know, <laughs> this is my last moment. And he never put it together, but he knew he knew me, but he could never put it together. And I tell you, I was scared. That was nuts. Wow. But he was, he was treated like royalty when he came out and Bobby LaPuma deferred to him a lot. So let's talk about. Your one major role in that That's bus interesting too, though. was the fact that you introduced Frank Panessa, another one of your partners in, in, in the DEA, another legendary undercover officer that we actually had uh, on a previous yeah. episode of the OG. Yeah. And we're going to have uh, him on many more. And we want to do one with the, both of you guys talking about uh, working together. But you introduced Frank into the Jackalones by making an introduction to Bobby LaPuma. And La Puma then introduced Panessa to other members of uh, the drug operation, yes. which ended up going down, I believe, in 1988. Yeah, exactly. What what and, and what what I did just just to tell you, I'm I'm giving you little tidbits. Maybe you don't need them about the nature of undercover because that was always my thing. And I mean, I learned it taught myself. But what I did is I had a snitch introduce Frank to Bobby LaPuma, and then I introduced us together. So Frank and I met 
because we both knew the mob, but I wanted us each to be clean. So, you know, and then, so then we were, Frank and I were like together, but that was, that was the, that's a smarter way to do it because otherwise if I get burned, Frank gets burned because I brought Frank in and at the same time it's vice versa. And that's an other, it's a great way to have each other's back as well. If you know what I mean, it's just a much smarter way to do business, I guess, just to put it to you that way. Describe Bobby LaPuma for a second. For people that don't know, Bobby LaPuma was kind of the the number one collector, enforcer, quote unquote, alleged yeah. hitman for for the Jackalonies. Yeah. He was about six five, uh, didn't have any hair, but had like a Fu Manchu mustache and was just very imposing. Would you say that's accurate? He was a presence. He he was uh he was like the rock. Yeah. I mean, you know, he 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 really had a presence. And when you were around him, and I socialized with him a lot, you know, at the silent woman in different places. Um, I have a, if we have time, I have a quick funny story about him, uh, you know, uh, but anyway, uh, he, he was kind of dark, dark skin, handsome, you know, um, well built. His, the way he carried himself, you knew you weren't going to mess with that guy. I mean, you just knew. And when he spoke to you, he really, you listened, you know, he was, he, every, everything about him was very firm and very planted and very intentional. I not, I never saw him crack a joke. You never saw him crack a smile? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They called him the animal. I, and I think one of the things that uh, pops in my head when I think about Bobby Puma, I think about a, an episode that we did um, with a victim's brother, of someone that Lapuma might have been involved in in killing, and Lapuma had visited this victim, you know, a week or two before he was murdered, and had vandalized his car and had threatened him. And I'm like, when you're reaching the point where Bobby Lapuma is coming to your business and putting his hands on you and putting his hands on your property, yeah. it's at that point to either shut it down, <laughs> either seek help from law enforcement and go into witness protection or right. get on the first plane to Brazil. Right. right. Like, that's DEFCON 4 when Bobby yeah. Lapuma is coming to let you know that you're, you're, you're treading on thin ice. Yeah. But um, so give us your quick, give us your quick Lapuma anecdote. Uh, so you remember the Stabiles got executed? Yeah, that was in that same Um, 1985, uh, uh, there was a rash of murders from like April to October. I think there was like somewhere where uh, close to a dozen murders, um, all mob related. It was the last time that the Detroit mob was very active uh, in in gangland hits. And one of those murders was Anthony Stabile, who was a bookmaker that was tied in to the Jackalones. And I believe they killed him and his wife. Right. Yeah. I'm a farmer in the Eastern market. So real quick. So I would spend a lot of time in the golden mushroom. And after it went down, I knew that I frankly had uh, people doing surveillance on me because everybody knew the mob was in the restaurant. And uh, so I was just in there having a glass of wine and stuff. And this guy comes up pretending like he's drunk uh, in a suit. You know, I'm not saying he had wingtips, but uh, I don't know. But he started pumping me about the murders because I had been designated or they figured out that I knew the mafia people. And he was just on and on and on and on. And he just so pissed me off. And I finally just got up and said, you should keep your fucking mouth shut. You know, and I went That's to gangster. another part of the restaurant and I was eating and Bobby and Roby Warren, who we haven't even talked about, who ran the silent woman. He was the manager for him on Golden Gloves, boxing champ. They came in and they're like, hey, Trish, what's going on? And I said, I got to tell you about that guy over there. He's asking about the Stabiles, you know, and he's pumping in. And Bobby looks at me and says, okay, Trish, it's time for you to go. We'll handle it. <laughs> so I got up and left. And when I did, they were over leaning over the guy. Now, That's if awesome. I thought they were going to hurt the guy in the restaurant, of course I wouldn't have done that. But it was, it was just stupid. You know, it was just a stupid scenario. And I knew they were just going to send him on his way. So Bobby LaPuma, uh, as we're going to wrap up here, Trisha introduced Frank Panessa through one of her informants to LaPuma. LaPuma gets his hooks into the Jackaloni crew via that introduction. 
Um, fast forward a year, I believe uh, it was spring of 1988, indictment comes down. The Puma's nailed on a, uh, on a cocaine trafficking charge. The case is tied into uh, Como's restaurant, who at the time, the ownership of Como's, um, some people that were connected to the ownership were involved in that bust. Um, La Puma came out of prison. I think he did 10, 15 years, came out of prison, was briefly back here in Detroit, um, but is now living in retirement in Colorado Springs. If he's listening, how you doing, Bob? Come on and give us an interview. But uh, he's he's still alive. Billy Jackaloni has been dead for a long, uh, since 2012. Uh, Tony Jackaloni yeah, yeah. died yeah. in 2001. Al Haiti died at some point in the 90s or early 2000s. So pretty much yeah. everyone we're talking about yeah. is gone. Alan Hilf died in 14. Yeah. But uh, your work, obviously, even though you weren't the one slapping the handcuffs on people, your work uh, paid a lot of dividends because a lot of those guys that were uh, surrounding the uh, Jack Only brothers that were dealing drugs all went to prison. And a lot of those, um, those operations were, were brought down uh, via, via your, your tireless work. Can we do a part yes, two of this? Thank you. Uh, can we have you definitely need Patty to have, back on have her back on with Frank Panessa. Uh, we could have her on back on with, yeah. with the Detroit uh, PD officer. She was talking about, she is, this has been just yeah. a amazing interview. That's just, chock full with so much information so many great stories it's it it, it, it's in the wheelhouse of of just talking about uh uh, people overcoming the odds and and being a a female in law enforcement and having the success that she was able to have is such a testament to the type of person she was and and really again just being a um a trailblazer for women in law enforcement and, and being someone that opens all these doors and, and, and pro- provides opportunities by the roots that, that she laid down back in the 1970s. And that's just, it's inspiring. And oh, thank you so much for coming on the OG. You, you, you've done it all. You've said it all. You've lived a thousand lives and we're going to have you back on to talk about uh, more of your work. And we just appreciate your uh your your honesty and your forthrightness and and you're a great storyteller and you're just you know everyone I've spoken to about you are always like uh that woman is a is a true superstar um and someone that that really sets the standard high for for any female that's trying to do what you did I I must say I'm sitting here with tears in my eyes because honestly I'm I'm very flattered the bottom line, I will just say, is I think we all have gifts, and I found out this was my gift. I think the hardest job on the planet right now is being a parent, raising and protecting children. I couldn't do it. We all just have our niche, and I'm grateful that I was able to find mine, and I thank you so much for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for letting us reminisce. Oh, Thank no, you. and we're going to do it more. But when we end, I want, I want you to give just one, one quick thought that's popping up in my head right now that I think is somewhat relevant. We were talking a little bit about what happened with the, the Capitol riot back on January 6th. And oh, just yeah. let, let our yeah. audience know what a member of law enforcement, a member of federal law enforcement sitting there watching uh, the insanity on our television where our, our capital is overrun and taken over for the first time in, in over 150 years. Um, what, what, what is someone that, it, that was at such a high level of law enforcement? What do you think in watching that? I, as I mentioned, was a weapons and tactics instructor for DEA. And uh, I, I actually was the only female to sit on the formulation committee for the National Trauma Team that goes in and intervenes on shootings and kidnappings and murders and stuff. And when I saw what was done to our own people, I wanted to, I wanted to pack my guns and go and fight to protect them in DC because I was afraid it was going to be where more people were going to see this and jump in their trucks and stuff and head to DC. I am so disgusted with what is going on in our country. We're killing our own first responders and people who've served this country. We have got to stop and turn it around and think. Stop listening to propaganda. Stop. This is horrible. When she said that to me the other day, it it really resonated. And it actually brought me back uh, to when I was watching it, 
unfold that that afternoon. I'm thinking to myself, what are people like Patty? What are people that were federal law enforcement that are sitting here watching this? What are they thinking? So I got a, a, a great opportunity to talk to Patty about this. And I thought it would be a great way to kind of end, uh, end our interview, because I think that that probably speaks for a lot of the federal law enforcement that were watching these historic times unfold uh, in real time. You know, call, call me. Put me into service. I'll be there. <laughs> This was great. This was this definitely has to go down in the pantheon of all time great OG interviews in terms of uh, the, oh the, the the level of insight, the uniqueness of the story, the the pioneering nature of what she did. Patty Naughton, you are a superstar. You're always welcome back here on the OG. We're going to have you on a bunch more times. Patty and I are also working on something uh, along with Frank Panessa out in California mm-hmm. in the uh, scripted yeah. drama space. We got some real major players interested um, in, in pushing forth a, a scripted television drama. So we'll see where that goes. Hopefully we'll see, you know, Patty uh, and Frank Panessa's characters. We'll get like Gal Gadot to play <laughs> to play Patty and we'll, we'll get Brad Pitt to play <laughs> uh, Frank Panessa. And we'll be off and running. Well, thank you so much, Patty. We got to we got to go. Make sure people out there listening like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch our YouTube videos, keep spreading the word about the OG podcast, please. For Jimmy Bucciolato, Patty Naughton, this is Scott Bernstein from the Original Gangsters Podcast. We'll be back next week with fresh content. See you then. Out.